Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, we're going to be shifting gears today. Uh, somehow the timing all lined up. We're switching to a new, uh, a new module in the course, and we're also going to switch gears in the fourth deliverable now, which I'll talk about uh, shortly, but just so, so we have sort of a big picture of where we are and where we're going. We've finished lectures one through eight now where we've been talking about HCI design. So we borrowed a lot of ideas from software engineering, how to write code, but hopefully by now you have a good understanding that there's a lot more to HCI to getting your code to, to run without crashing. So we're going to switch gears now and starting in lecture nine, we're going to start to talk about cognitive psychology. So the particular aspects of psychology that have to do with cognition which is the part of your brain that is being used to make predictions about what's going to happen in, in the future. So obviously, we could spend the entire course or several courses talking about cognitive psychology. I'm going to pick and choose a few, uh, a few topics to touch on which are particularly relevant to HCI. And I've organized our lectures on cognitive psychology going from the most objective to the most subjective. So. It's relatively easy to pin down what it is about the brain or, or how it is that we make predictions about what we expect to see next on our phone. Um, memory, attention, and perception. What do we really mean by memory and attention and perception? Things get a little, a little hazy here. We're going to talk about gestalt perception and frame of reference. And finally, affective computing or affect, which is the emotional side of of your thinking. So again, as we often do in HCI, we're going to go from things that are objective and easy to pin down to things that are subjective, have to do with aesthetics, uh, have to do with the, the right brain or left brain. We'll come in the next one, one second. Okay. So that's that's where we're going uh, in probably the next two weeks or so. So we'll uh, start lecture nine in a few minutes. But uh, again, I want to start by talking about the deliverables. Um, I've seen that 25 of you have submitted deliverable three. That means that there are 12 of you that have not yet submitted deliverable three. Um, again, if you have not submitted deliverable three yet, make sure you get it submitted as soon as possible. All of these deliverables are cumulative, so you don't want to fall behind. A um, couple things about deliverable three that may be holding people up. Seems that a lot of people had problems saving and loading back in matrices who had problems with the load and save function. OK, quite a few people. Uh, some of you found a workaround uh, using uh, pickling. This is a nice, uh, a nice feature of Python. If you don't know what pickling is, uh, Google Python pickling. Um, a lot of the different libraries in Python, if you use a particular library's load and save commands, it has its own particular format for loading and saving things, and sometimes it's, it's problematic. Pickling is a way to just say, I don't care what's in this data structure or in this object, just pickle it into, uh, uh, pickle it and save it out to the disk. I don't care what the format is. And then you can read it back in using, I think it's unpickle, right? Um, so th this might work. If you're still having problems with load and save, use pickle and unpickle. 
Did anybody use pickle to get them out of this particular pickle? Okay, good. A few of you have already figured that, that out. Okay. Um, if you're having problem, if things are holding you up in deliverable three, other than loading and saving, come and see the TA or come and see me and let's get that resolved as quickly as possible so we can move on to deliverable four. Any quick questions about deliverable three that I can try and answer? Okay. So, uh, just as a reminder, I'm sure it's fresh in your mind, uh, deliverable three, the bulk of the work here was capturing the data from leap motion and storing it into these three-dimensional matrices, right? This three-dimensional matrix has all the information your system is going to need in future to be able to recognize whether a student has correctly signed one of the ten ASL digits. So in deliverable four, we're now going to switch gears and focus on how we can actually get your computer to recognize whether the student has signed the correct sign or not. So deliverable four, unlike, uh, unlike deliverable three, is relatively short, 36 steps and seven pages. But for most of you, there's going to be a lot of new concepts in deliverable four that you might not have, have seen before. So again, get, if you haven't get, gotten started on Deliverable 4, do so as soon as possible. Okay, I'm going to walk you through, I'm going to spend the first part of today walking you through uh, what's new in Deliverable 4, uh, which will hopefully help you. Uh, we're going to do things the old-fashioned way. I'm going to work mostly at the board, and you're going to take notes. These aren't in the lecture slides. So we're going to be talking today mostly about uh, machine learning. So I'm going to keep a running list of terms here, which you may or may not have heard of before. So let's start with machine learning. So machine learning is a particular field in computer science that uh, deals with how do we actually find patterns in data. How will your system know that this particular collection of numbers corresponds to zero, or that this collection of numbers corresponds to the number one, or two, or three, or what have you. So machine learning is all about trying to find patterns in data. Okay. So in deliverable four, uh, you're going to be implementing a particular machine learning uh, algorithm that does classification. So classification refers to any machine learning algorithm that's trying to predict a particular class. So I'm going to just use as a cartoon our little cube here. So whenever I draw this cube, this is supposed to represent a collection of numbers that we've collected from uh, lead motion. And given all of those numbers, we want our machine learning algorithm to be able to predict the class, which in our case is going to be zero or one or two all the way up to to nine which of the ten ASL digits is the user signing or is it n none of these ten digits okay so classification is when we're trying to predict uh, an integer some of you might have heard about or done regression anybody worked with regression before <coughs> linear regression so regression is a different collection of machine learning algorithms where instead of predicting an integer or a discrete class, you're trying to predict uh, a real number. So uh, we're not going to deal with regression in this class. We're just going to focus on classification. And we're going to focus on a particular classification algorithm known as k nearest neighbor. And I'm going to walk you through the k nearest neighbor algorithm today. So basically what the k-nearest neighbor algorithm is going to allow us to do is clarify this arrow here. How do we go from this collection of numbers to an integer, a, a correct prediction about what the user actually did? Has anyone seen the k and n algorithm before? A couple people. Okay, so this will be new for, for most of you. Okay, so I'm going to describe the k-nearest neighbor algorithm to you geometrically with the picture so that you have an intuition for how this algorithm works um, and that will help you greatly with deliverable four. So let's imagine uh, that we want to create, uh, we want to be able to predict not hand gestures 
but which particular species of flower uh, we found in a field. So let's imagine you go out in a field and you start picking uh, flowers, and for each flower that you pick, you measure two different features. So we'll call this F1 for the first feature and F2 for the second feature. So maybe when you pick a flower, you measure the length of the petals, which could be the first feature, and you count the number of petals that that flower has. So for each, uh, each flower that you pick, you're going to record two numbers, the value of feature one and the value of feature two. And if we then plot an individual flower, that's going to tell us where in this plot it sits based on these two features. Okay, let's imagine that we take a flower expert along with us, and for every flower that we pick, we measure F1 and F2, and our flower expert tells us that's an iris, that's a daisy, that's a rose, that's a particular species of rose, and so on. They're telling us which flower it is, which corresponds to the particular <laughs> class we eventually want to be able to predict on our own. So we're going to try and use K-nearest neighbor where we can go out armed with our machine learning algorithm, pick a flower, and the computer will tell us if we measure these two things what flower it is. We don't need the expert anymore. This is where we're, we're going with this. Okay, so features are numbers which describe an individual flower in our case, and the class is the thing that we're eventually going to predict. So this could be rose, daisy, iris, or in our case, the digit zero, the digit one, the digit two, and so on. So far so good? Okay, so we've picked one flower, and let's say that uh, this equals rose. Hopefully you can distinguish a rose from another type of flower, but let's assume that you can't. We pick another flower, measure F1 and F2, and our expert also tells us that that's a rose. We pick a third flower, we measure uh, the, number, the length of the petals and the number of petals, and our expert tells us that particular flower is an iris. Okay, so we have two different classes now, rose and iris, and we keep picking flowers, we keep measuring the features, and our expert keeps giving us back the class to which that particular flower belongs. So we've measured this many flowers, and we've gotten back this many number of classes. Now we have a data set, and in machine learning, this is called our training set, because we're going to use this particular collection of data to train our nearest neighbor algorithm to be able to predict flowers on its own, so that no longer, we no longer need the expert. All right, so now we've got our training set. How exactly does, K, how exactly does the k-nearest neighbor algorithm learn to predict for a new flower which of these two classes, if any, it belongs to? Well, let's see how well you do. Let's say I pick a particular, a new flower. So the expert's gone home. We're still out in the field. I pick a new flower. It has this particular uh, petal length and these number of petals, which flower do you think it is? <coughs> rose. Why do you think it's a rose? I'll put it in as a dashed line to represent that this is our prediction. We don't actually know what it is because we don't have our expert. Um, the roses are in that area. Okay, they're in that area. They seem to be clustered in a particular part of the feature space. So you could probably mentally draw some line that lassoes these, these points, and that represents a particular part of the feature space that seems to be filled with, with roses. OK, you can probably see where this is get going. You pick another flower, and you measure F1 and F2 for that flower. Which of the two classes does this flower belong to? 
Probably. Sorry? The iris, right? It's probably an iris. Let's let's predict that. You pick an, a third flower here. Which flower is this? Hard to say. Right? Why is it hard to say? Given this geometric interpretation of our algorithm here, why is it difficult to know whether it's a rose or an iris? Absolutely, it's in the area where both flowers start to overlap. So if we look here and we look in the neighborhood of this flower, so what are the other flowers for which we know the classes that happen to be nearby the flower that we're trying to predict? There are two roses that are close by and two irises that are close by. So who knows which, which one this is, right? Hard to make a prediction in, in this case. Okay. So the k nearest neighbor algorithm, as you might be able to guess from now, says for any given point that you want to try and predict, look at the k nearest neighbors. So we need to define a distance between this point and <coughs> all of the other points. And in this case, if we say k is equal to 4, so we say for any new flower, find the four flowers that are, find the four closest flowers and look at which classes those flowers belong to. And within that set of four flowers, look for the class that's in the majority, meaning which has more, which, which has uh, more of that particular label, and that's our guess. Okay, so we're now basically talking about a model and we're going to come back to this term many times in the rest of this course. So in the case of the k nearest neighbor, our model, or in all the algorithms, the model is the thing that makes the prediction. So this is why I wanted to write down all this terminology. The machine learning algorithm, which in our case is the KNN algorithm, is the thing that makes the model. And then the model is the thing that makes the prediction. Is this a rose? Is this an iris? So in deliverable four, you're going to be creating a k-nearest neighbor model. And that model, instead of predicting roses, is going to make predictions about whether the user just signed 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 and so on. So in the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, the reason I chose this particular algorithm for our class is it's the simplest possible one. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, it's very intuitive, and in order to make this model, we need to provide the training set. So the model is made up of the training set itself. If we didn't have the training set, how is, how is the model going to be able to make the prediction? What else do we need in our model for the k-nearest neighbor algorithm to make predictions? What am I missing in this model so far? The distance, so that's that's a good point actually. Um, I won't get into this too much. I'll just write this as dm for distance metric. So how do we actually measure the distance between a particular point and another point? Luckily, Python is going to hide that detail from you. You don't need to choose a distance metric. It'll choose one for you. That was a good point. What else are we missing here? What else do we need before our model can start to make predictions like we did in our cartoon example here? Data to compare it to the training set. Uh, yeah, actually, yes. So that I forgot to mention that. So we also have another data set, which is our testing set. So in our cartoon example here, our testing set is made up of this flower, this flower, and this flower, right? So our testing set is our ability to be able to test how well our model is doing. How many out of these three flowers does it get? Does it get right? So I'll put this in here as well as T lowercase s t, our testing set, our testing set. What else do we need? So let's see, we have our, we have our training set, so we have our squares and circles. 
we have a, we have a distance metric so we can measure how far this flower is from this flower and how far this flower is from this flower. We want our model to make a prediction. What else are we missing? The classes themselves, okay. Let, let's assume they're in the training set. So the training set contains, actually maybe this helps to write this out. The training set contains all of the features and all of the classes. So that's already in our model. It's got the values of F1 and F2 for each of our flowers and the classes for each of these flowers. <coughs> the number of neighbors, right? Which is K, K nearest neighbors. Okay, so armed with all of this, our model should now be able to assign a class to each of our, uh, to each of our uh, individuals in the test set. And when it does, it's going to make a prediction. So in this case, uh, the, dotted, the dotted circle indicates that our uh, our algorithm is predicting a rose in this case, and an iris in this case, and maybe it returns a class saying, I have no idea in this case. How do we know how well our KNN algorithm did in this cartoon example? So if I collected all this information about the flowers, I put all that information in there, I defined a distance metric, I picked three new flowers, and I don't know what those classes are, and K, how am I going to know how well it did? Distances are small, or certainly are smaller than, because if you're comparing the neighbors to your testing thing, and if the distances between them are small. Then maybe we're pretty good, right? Pretty so good. if I picked a flower that's out, that's out here, who knows, right? Might not, might not work very well. Okay. If I really want to know how well this model is doing, I got to call up my flower expert and have him or her come back in and tell me what the actual labels are for these three flowers, right? There's no really good way that I can know how good the model is unless I can compare the model's predictions against the actual classes assigned by the the expert. So far so good? Okay, one of the things that makes machine learning so difficult is uh, what should be the value of k? So there's some parameters here, or in our case, let's keep this simple, let's just imagine there's one parameter. What value should we assign to k? How many neighbors should we look at in order for our model to make good predictions? So let me just erase this circle here. We looked at k equals 4. What happens if k is 100, given this training set? How well is my model going to do? If I pick some new flowers and call up the expert, and he or she comes back and labels those, assigns classes to those flowers. <coughs> What's that? Why is it always going to be an iris? There's more irises, right? So we don't have a hundred, you're never going to have a hundred neighbors, so it'll find all the neighbors that it does have, which is all of them, and there just happen to be more irises. So what our model is always going to predict iris, no matter what, right? Even if something falls right here in the field of roses, it's always going to predict irises. So K is a little bit too big. What about k of 1? Let's go in the opposite direction, as small as possible. How's it going to do now? Probably better. Be definitely better than this, right? At least it's not always predicting irises, right? So if we happen to find a flower right here, we're probably going to do OK, assuming we're in the region of, uh, of uh, irises. What if we find a spot that's right here? We're very close to our one nearest neighbor, which happens to be a rose, but I tried to pick that point 
to be as close to a rose as possible, but still kind of in the field of irises, right? So it's it's gonna definitely gonna do better, but still probably not very well, right? So the black art of machine learning and the black art of using the k-nearest neighbor algorithm well is picking a good value for k. You want to look at enough of your neighbors so you're sort of getting a statistical sample, but you don't want to look at too many or else you're looking at neighbors that are too far uh, away from you. Okay. One last, uh, one last thing I want to define here, which you'll, uh, which you'll be measuring in deliverable four, is error, which is how many predictions did you get wrong out of all of the individuals in your your test set. And we're trying to get that error as low as possible. Okay, so in this cartoon example, uh, I used flowers, and that was a non-arbitrary choice. So in deliverable four, you're actually going to be working with a very famous training and testing set, which is an iris data set that was actually collected in the 1930s. So they were picking flowers that they knew belonged to my biology's uh, rusty. I don't know if iris is the genus or what have you, but they were picking flowers that they knew were irises, but they didn't know what particular species of iris it was. So they had an iris expert along who actually identified which iris family these individual flowers belong to. And they measured not just two features of each flower, but four features. And you can, and you can read up in deliverable four on this data set. So why did I draw this picture for you using only two features rather than four features? Could I have drawn it for you with all four features? What's that? It's two-dimensional, right? So you'll have to do this in your head now. So the actual data set you're going to be working with in uh, Deliverable 4 is a four-dimensional feature space. F1, F2, uh, F2, F3 and F4, right? So we're, we're actually working in a four-dimensional space, and inside that four-dimensional space is a sprinkling of points, where each point corresponds to a flower, and the shape of that point, if you like, represents the class that that flower belongs to. As I mentioned, you're not using leap motion in deliverable four. I want you to just build a k-nearest neighbor algorithm uh, in Python, and in order to do so, you're going to be using uh, a final Python library called scikit-learn. Python is wonderful in trying to come up with the maximally cryptic names for their, their libraries, right? Scientific, uh, sci a scientific kit of algorithms, which happen to be some machine learning ones. Uh, a scientific kit of learning algorithms, scikit-learn. Scikit-learn has built into it a function called KNN, and that's the function you're going to be using. So a lot of the effort that we just went through is hidden inside of the algorithm. You don't need to worry about the internals, but you need to be able to know whether you've implemented things correctly or, or not. If you train or you create your KNN model following the instructions in Deliverable 4, and the predictions that come back is every single flower belongs to iris family number two, something is probably wrong, right? What might that be? So you're going to play around a little bit with finding a good value of k for the iris data set. That's what you're doing in deliverable four. So far so good? Any questions about KNN? Okay. In deliverable five, you're going to be bringing together what you did in deliverable three with what you are going to do in deliverable four, so in deliverable five, you're going to take your KNN algorithm, which was predicting irises in deliverable four, and now it's going to start to predict ASL gestures in deliverable five. Things are going to get really tricky really quickly. Why? So now we're dealing with leap motion data and not measurements of flowers. Given this picture, what's the first big challenge we're going to come up against? Yes, lots of numbers, lots of features, right? So in the iris data set, we have four features. So we're dealing with a four-dimensional feature space. 
What is the dimension of the feature space you're going to be dealing with in deliverable five? How many numbers do we have? We did we did part of this calc we did this calculation last week, I think. More than four, right? How do we do this calculation? How do we know how many features there are here, at least to start with? Five times four times six. Thank you. Five fingers. For each finger, we have four bones. And for each bone, we have the x, y, and z of the base of the bone and the x, y, and z of the tip of the bone for six numbers per bone, giving us a total of 120 dimensional feature space. If you're not scared by now, you, you should be. Yes? Can you draw that for me? Sure, <laughs> no problem. Exactly. I can't imagine four dimensions. Good luck with, with 120, right? OK. The big challenge we're going to face in deliverable five going forward is reducing this number, right? Why? What does it matter? Even if we can't imagine it, as long as we have an intuition for a few features and we've debugged our KNN algorithm so that it cor correctly predicts using the IRIS data set, we pull out the IRIS data set and plug in the data that we're generating with Leap Motion. Who cares if it's in 120 dimensions compared to four? Does it matter? OK, there's another very famous problem in machine learning. We won't go into it. It's called the curse of dimensionality. curse of dimension I. It's called the curse because things work nicely in low dimensions, but things become more difficult in higher dimensions. And every few years, a machine learning person comes along and says, I I've solved the dimensionality problem. Things behave nicely in 120 dimensions rather than four. And their colleagues look at their research paper and they say, no, 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 you made a mistake here. It's hard to get, get away from the curse. It always seems to come back and get us what do you think happens? What's, what would make our model do well or poorly? We know that choosing K poorly will make our model predict poorly. What else might hobble our model? Why, did it, why does it work relatively well in this cartoon example here for a K of, of 4? It doesn't always work, but works most of the time. Absolutely, right? So they're geometrically se separated, right? When you start to go up to very high dimensions, imagine now, so in deliverable, where are we now? In deliverable uh, three, you are capturing three or four or five gestures, right? Each one of those has 120 numbers. If you imagine each gesture that you captured as one point in this 120 dimensional space, and you captured a whole bunch of zeros, and you captured a whole bunch of ones, do you think that the zeros and the ones are going to be clearly separate in this 120-dimensional space? Who knows? I don't have an intuition about 120 dimensions, and I imagine you don't either. So. Without this intuition, the best thing we can do is try and reduce the number of dimensions. We're going to spend a lot of time in the next few weeks trying to reduce this number. And we brainstormed a little about this last time. The first thing we can do is throw away redundancy. So there's a lot of numbers in here that are the same. What are they? Uh, the tips and bases can overlap. That's right. So wherever the tip of one bone overlaps the base of another one, those two, those two sets of six numbers are redundant. We can throw one of them out, right? So I can't do the calculation on my head, but if we do that, we compress things pretty nicely, and we'll spend time compressing down and down and down. We're not going to get down to four, 
but at least my experience last year was we were able to compress enough, assuming that we collect a training set from all of you who all have differently sized hands and you're going to capture your data in rooms that have slightly different lighting. Some of you are going to capture with your right hand. Some of you are going to capture with your left hand. In later deliverables, we're going to put all of those cubes together. And if we have enough of them, there should be a good separation between all the zeros, all the ones, all the twos, and so on. And if we give that combined training set to scikit-learn's KNN algorithm, it should be able to predict for new people whether they're actually signing zero, one, or two. Yes. Uh, not if the lefties in the room are willing to capture a lot more data for us than the righties. We'll get there. But yes, our algorithm probably, no matter how much effort the lefties do for us, our algorithm is probably always going to do a better job predicting for righties than lefties. Right? We're already excluding one of our demographics, which we said we should never do in HCI. Why? Why does it not, not matter how much training data our lefties generate for us? Where are the lefties in this room? Because there are only a couple of them. There's only a couple of them, so we give them 10 times as much work as everybody else. Still not going to be enough. Why not? Exactly, right? None of our lefties can grow or shrink the size of their, their hands. So we're just going to hope that however many lefties we have in the class, there's a sufficient spread in the size of their hands that our KNN algorithm will be able to do something with, with the lefty data. Okay, so you've correctly identified why we're spending so much time in an HCI class about talking about machine learning, right? If we really want to be careful about not marginalizing some of our users, we have to think carefully about what is our machine learning algorithm doing? What can our minority demographic give us that will help with this process and so on? This is one of the beautiful things about HCI where thinking about the technology in this case, the machine learning blurs into thinking about our people, our users. Right? We have to think about both carefully to successfully produce an ASL educational uh, software system. Okay. All right, just a little bit about what you're going to be submitting for deliverable four, and then we'll jump back to lecture. Here is the actual picture of the iris data set. So however many flowers they actually picked. Again, I can't draw things in four dimensions. So I've only plotted two of the four features that are associated with each flower. The color now, rather than the shape, represents which of the three irises those flowers actually were. That's just the training data. So that's the data we use to train the k-nearest neighbor. This picture now is my attempt to create a visualization to show the training data, which is all the dots that are circled in black. And all the dots that are, are not circled in black are the testing data. And you'll notice that in the testing data, some circles are solid and some have a differently colored edge. I'm trying to maximize the data to ink ratio. What do you think that's going to tell you? Why did I visualize the testing, the testing set in this way? Maybe how sure you are about the information. Okay, how how is that visualized here? Yes. Okay, so what does it mean that some have a differently colored edge and some are solid? The the fill color is what is most likely. And match, and then the um, the, the uh, border yep. can sort of be also in the middle. Yeah. Very cool. It, it is the guess. <laughs> so the color on the inside of the dot is the actual class of the flower. So the expert came back and labeled all of the irises in the testing set. So the inner color here represents which iris it actually is, and the color of the edge 
represents the prediction. Remember that our KNN algorithm is always giving us back an integer as a prediction, right? It's the zeroth type of iris, or the first type of iris, or the second type of iris. That's why we have red, green, and blue here. I mean, the three colors. So what do the solid dots represent, and what do the multicolored dots represent? Multicolored are errors, right? So these are actually encircled in red as well. This particular flower was a red iris, and our KNN algorithm correctly predicted that it's a red iris. This iris down here was actually a green iris, but our KNN algorithm failed and predicted that it was a blue iris. So in a single visualization, you can see the training data, you can see the test data, and you can see the predictions, which are the colors of the edges, and you can see the error, which is the difference between the inner color and the outer color. Okay, given all of that, how well was my KNN algorithm doing in this case? Not perfect, <coughs> but not bad. It did better with certain irises than others. Which irises did it do well predicting? In fact, it did perfect for one type of virus. Which one? The red one, right? So all of the test data plotted here, all of the red irises were co correctly predicted to be red irises. Why did it do so well with the red irises, and it didn't do so well with the green and the blue irises? Exactly. So here's a blue iris. We look at the K nearest neighbors, and if you look at the inner colors, I can't remember what the K actually was in this case. It actually is the case that there are more, there are more green irises in this set than there are blue irises in the training set, which are the ones that have the black edges around. So this is always true of any machine learning algorithm. If there is not a good separation between the features, it's not going to do a very good job being able to predict which class they belong to. So this is, again, one of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time on in the next few weeks in the deliverables is collecting gesture data, getting as much of it as we can to help our model, and also helping it to separate these data points, trying to create as good a separation as, as possible. Okay. So a lot of the steps in Deliverable 4 are going to lead you up to recreating exactly this picture. But you're not submitting this picture, because this picture reports, uh, it reports the first and the fourth feature. Remember that for the IRIS data set, there's four features. So I picked two of the four, one and four. You're going to be submitting a single image, which is the same picture, but using features two and three. Make sense? And you'll be able to tell from your picture whether your KNN algorithm is working correctly or not. So another difference between Deliverable 4 and the previous three is you are comparing your image against or your video against uh, what's in here. So here you're submitting now an image where we're not giving you what the actual image should, should look like. So we're really sure that your, your KNN algorithm, so all of your KNN algorithms are working before we unplug the iris data set and plug in uh, all of our loop motion data. Make sense? OK. Most of the details of that are, are written in there. There's a lot of pointers uh, in the deliverable to URLs that tell you more about k-nearest neighbors and the iris data set, which you can read at your leisure. OK. OK. All right, back to the schedule for a moment. Um, this is, a, uh, as I mentioned, the timing worked out very well this week, uh, this year, because we just finished talking about models, and now we're going to start our discussion of cognitive psychology by talking about the models that are, that are in here. Um, there's required and optional reading for today. I'm going to draw some examples from uh, a research paper that I wrote a few years ago 
Um, so the research paper itself is the optional reading. Uh, it's pretty technical. You can have a look if you want. Um, we're going to talk about this robot in a moment. The required reading is a more popular science description of what we did, which somewhat tongue-in-cheek was called, What Do Robots Dream Of? So we're going to talk about mental models for our robots before we talk about mental models for, for humans. Okay, that's the required reading for, for today. Okay, so let's start with uh, our robot here, which uh, when we built this 10 years ago, we turned it on for the first time, we turned it on in the research lab, and there was a student sitting next, uh, nearby who turned around and said, dude, that's the evil starfish. And uh, the nickname stuck, so this is the, uh, the evil starfish uh, robot. And so I'm going to talk you through how we built this robot, why we built this robot. We built it because it's going to develop, the robot is going to develop a model of its own and use that model to make predictions. Okay. How does this work? Well, we turned on this robot very much like most of us when we were born. We didn't have any real mental model. We weren't able to make predictions about what was going to happen to us a second or a, a minute or a day into the future. Hopefully now you can be a little bit better about making predictions what's going to happen to you in the future. So it took us growing up from infants into adults to build up these mental models. Psychologists are still not really clear about how we do that. But we tried to do it for a robot, so at least we could make this explicit. So we, I'm going to show you how this robot builds up a mental model and how the robot then uses this mental model to make predictions and get around in the, in the real world. OK, so that's what the robot looks like. Um, we're going to focus on just two sensors. So this robot has two sensors uh, on its main body, which record how much it tilts to the left and the right and how much it tilts forward and back. So every time the robot moves, there are these two tilt angles which change. Right? Remember when we were talking about John Dewey, you push against the world, or in our case, the robot moves, and you sense how the world pushes back. Right? You do something, and you see the sensory repercussion of that action. Our robot does the same thing. Our robot moves, and those two tilt angles change. We told the robot a little bit. We told it that it was made up of these nine pieces. They're kind of like Lego. And what the robot was trying to do is figure out how these nine pieces are put together. So our robot doesn't have a camera. It can't see itself. All it has are these two tilt numbers whenever it moves. How does it know whether this is a good description of itself or this or this? So our mental models for this robot are basically just how are these nine pieces put together? Very simple mental model. OK. So how would it know whether any of these given models <coughs> is correct? So here's one mental model here. How does the robot know how good this particular uh, model is at making predictions about what's going to happen next? Well, it does so in the following way. So the physical robot up here receives motor commands. So it, it comes up with an idea of how to move. John Dewey said, movement is primary. Move and see what happens. So the robot decides how to move in a particular way. And I'm going to play a video for you in a moment. You can see this in action. The robot decides to move in a particular way. And that generates some sensor signals, which are just these two tilt angles. The robot begins by generating a random mental model. So it puts these nine pieces together randomly, and then executes the same motor commands it did in reality. So up here, the robot has eight motors. And down here, it also has eight motors. Four motors at the shoulders, at the four shoulders, and an additional four motors at the four elbows. OK. So the simulated robot sends the same commands to its eight motors that the physical robot sent to its eight motors. And the simulated robot gets back two tilt angles, which are just represented here as sensor signals flying. Armed with these two pairs of numbers, how does the robot know how good this particular mental model is? Okay. 
given this particular mental model, what do you think the relationship is between sensor signals and sensor signals prime? That it's good, right? Exactly. So if this set of tilt angles, if these two tilt angles match these two tilt angles, that's pretty good. The mental model made a prediction that matches reality, right? Not unlike we just talked about here with our k-nearest neighbors. A robot is not running the k-nearest neighbors algorithm. It's running a more sophisticated algorithm that we're not going to talk about today. But it's the same, the same idea. Let me try and play this. Uh, let's see here. Uh, lar more large so you can see it. All right, here we go. OK, so the robot is going to start by generating internal models. So here's our robot in its infant form. The robot's just been born, and it chooses to move randomly. This is how our robot moved. At this point, our robot doesn't know anything about itself. So what you're going to watch in the next few seconds now is the robot very quickly sifting through lots of different kinds of mental models. How are these mental models? Are they matching what reality? They don't look anything like the robot whatsoever. Right? Turns out, however, that these terrible mental models are actually producing similar sensor data. It's actually matching what the robot got in reality. How is that possible? I just finished telling you that if the mental model doesn't resemble the physical robot, then there shouldn't be a match between these sensor signals. That's it. Our physical robot has only been alive for three seconds, right? It just did this and got back two tilt angles. With just this one piece of three-second experience in the real world, there's an almost infinite number of mental models that, that can reproduce that sensor data. OK, so our robot basically has all these different mental models that are all completely different, and they're all matching its physical experience. So the robot knows, wait a second, I only have one form. And the fact that all these mental models are different means something's wrong. So if you were the robot, what would you do next? Move again. Move again, right? So you'll notice the text down in the bottom left. So what our robot actually does is move for about three seconds and then think, quote unquote search through all the possible models that it can come up with, looking for models that produce the same sensor data that it experienced in reality. Move, think, move, think, move, think, goes back and forth. I just showed you in this video the first movement and the first round of thinking. Instead of boring you with the second through the seventh, I jumped forward to the eighth. So this is the eighth time that the robot has moved. And when I unpause the video, we're going to go back inside the brain of the robot, and you're going to watch what it comes up with. OK. So now, after eight experiences with the real world, this is its best guess about how it's put together. How is it doing? How is its mental model? Pretty bad. If you watch carefully, at just this moment in the experiment, it hit on this model and said, oh, wait a second, I just found this mental model. And this is explaining much more of these eight experiences that I've had than any of the models I've seen so far. This is really good. It's not perfect, but it's explaining most of the eight experiences. And half a second later, it hits on this one and says, this is the best I've seen so far. I've jumped forward again now to the 16th and final cycle. So it's now moving for the 16th time. And now this is what's going on inside its quote unquote brain. It's converged on just this one kind of mental model 
that explains all the experiences it's had so far. So by interacting with the physical world, it's generated enough data and used a learning algorithm to learn what this model is. It has an understanding of its own body. Well, who cares, right? It has a model, but what good is the model? The reason we've gone to all the effort of creating a robot that can generate its own model is it's going to use this model to make predictions. So now that the robot has learned something about itself, we're going to ask the robot to do something. And in the video I'm going to show you in a moment, we've asked the robot to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Not a very difficult task. And before the physical robot moved, the robot just sat there and said, OK, I know what you want me to do. I'm going to think about it. So it's taken its mental model, and it's now mentally rehearsing. If I rotate motor 1, then rotate motor 3, then 7, then 2, then 3, then 2, then 3. If I rotate my motors in that way, if I think about moving in that way, I will actually move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. So our robot is mentally rehearsing or predicting what set of movements of its motors will cause it to do what we want it to do, which is move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. OK. So it took a few minutes to come up with this way of moving. And now, tries it in reality. You see why the student nickname is the other side. OK, so what I've just walked you through is a relatively complex experiment. The details of the experiment for today are the optional reading. Um, but I want, what I want you to take away from this experiment is you've just seen a relatively simple machine that builds a model of itself and then uses it to make predictions. So in HCI, when you create an interface and your user starts tapping buttons or swiping the screen, they're doing something not that different from what the robot is doing. I wonder what the system will do, what sensory repercussion I will receive if I do this. And is that matching my expectation, yes or no? As it does, I start to build up a model of what I think the system will do if I do this, or if I do this. And I can start to, without having to actually do it, I can think, OK, I want to place a call, and I want to attach a photo to a text message. I can think about how I'm actually going to do it by using my mental model of the smartphone or the app or whatever. Right? This is what your users are doing all the time, and this is one of the most fundamental building blocks of cognition. Push against the world and see how it pushes back. Build up a mental model, and then use that mental model to make predictions before trying it out in reality. OK, that's all I have to say about the evil starfish. Any questions? OK. All right, after all that, back to, back to HCI. OK, people differ. And because people differ, they build different mental models. And the kinds of mental models they build depend not just on who they are, but what they want to do. So you can kind of tell how dated this slide is by me talking about an MP3 player. Um, your grandmother wants to buy you an MP3 player. She goes to Best Buy and asks somebody, does this thing play songs? The person says, yes, it's an MP3 player. If it doesn't. It's not, right? Your grandmother might build up a very different mental model of what an MP3 player is from what you consider an MP3 player. You might place certain devices into and out of the MP3 player class differently from how your, your grandmother might, might do so. OK. I love this example here uh, of a discretionary user. You get a new phone, and you don't want to learn all about the phone, but you want to know some basic things. And hopefully, if you're a student, one of the first things you want to learn to do is turn off the new message alarm. Right? Where is that particular function? You've used smartphones in the past, so you already have a mental model that predicts somewhere there is probably uh, something that allows you to turn on and off the new message alarm. Where is it? Right? Is it in 
the, uh, is it in the menu hierarchy for messages, or is it in the menu hierarchy that's rooted at options? In some phones, it's under messages. On other phones, it's under options. Where might your user, why, why might your user go looking in messages rather than options, or vice versa? When you get a new phone, where do you go looking for that function? You get the new iPhone and you had a previous iPhone, where do you go looking? I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know. Options, Options. okay. Imagine that in the new iPhone, that option was not in options, but was in messages, right? We have a lot of irate uh, Mac people emailing uh, Apple. Right? So your mental model is obviously based on your experiences, right? And in particular, on the systems that you've used in the past. We've talked about this quite a bit already, right? People have predictions, and they're looking for consistency. And often, it's conceptual consistency. So if I'm using an Apple phone, I expect certain things to be under options and other things to be under messages, and so on and, and so forth. Be, be aware of those things. Uh, if you have an early adopter, you have a, a geek, they'll go through and find every function. They'll systematically go through all the functions in the, the phone. Right? Different people are doing different things with the system, your, your new HCI system, and they're building up different mental models. Okay. We just saw this with the robot. How do you build up a mental model? Well, you push against the device and see how the device pushes back. So I put my smartphone in this box. What was this box called? We've seen this box a few times by now. The Skinner box, right? So we supply some stimuli, or our device receives some stimuli from outside, which is usually from the user. And the device provides response. And like Skinner did in the early 20th century, collected a whole bunch of stimuli and responses and tried to use this set of stimuli and responses to describe a model of the animal's behavior that was in the Skinner box. Users instinctually do the same thing. I'm going to click on all these different things with my new smartphone and see what responses I get back. Okay. And usually it's rote learning. This function produced this response, this function produced this response, and so on. And hopefully, after you've done that, you start to do some conceptual compression. Instead of memorizing all of where the functions are, you're building up, probably without realizing you're doing so, an understanding of where things are. So if you go looking for a new function, you'll be able to make a good, pretty good prediction about where that function will be in the menu, the menu hierarchy. Unfortunately, some users never get uh, beyond the stage. Um, several years ago, my father got his first computer and was learning a word processor. He hates computers with a passion. He told me, just write down on a sticky note, if I want to save a document, where do I go? If I want to load a document, where do I go? If I want to print something, so my poor father, his study is now littered with these uh, sticky notes, right? And as you can imagine, every once in a while, I get a call from my dad saying, how do I do this? It's not on the sticky notes, right? He, because he has never done any conceptual compression, he has no way to generalize, right? If you do rote learning, you can't generalize and you can't make good predictions about novel things. If you want to do something new with the word processor, if you've just memorized all the functions, you're, you're at a loss, right? So why do we do this conceptual compression? And again, you might not be aware that you're doing it, but if you do it well, you turn on your phone and there's something new you want to do with the phone, you're able to do it correctly the first time because you're making a prediction using your mental model of the system. Last week, we were talking about user evaluation. If you want to know whether your user actually built up a good mental model, let them play with your system and then ask them to do something novel with your system. And if they do it correctly the first time without referring to any help pages, you, they've built up the right mental model and they're using their mental model in, in the right way. Most people, when you corner them and really ask them to describe why they like this interface over this one, they'll end up telling you it's because I knew where to look or I knew what to do to carry out that function. Right? 
So one of the most important things you're doing in HCI design is building a system that helps your user build up a mental model. To take all of the raw data that they collect by interacting with your system and compressing this down into the right mental model. Hopefully, as the designer, you already have a mental model. We're going to create a new interface for the phone, and all the functionalities for this new phone are basically going to be lumped in these two different things, placing calls and sending texts. That's the basic clumps, right? Hopefully, your user, if you're experiencing your system, will build up a mental model very similar to yours. If it's not, then they probably have the wrong model, and they won't be able to make predictions. They'll go looking in the wrong place for novel functions. OK. This is, a, this is a great example. I hope to drive home this, this point. So uh, your, user, your user builds up a mental model by interacting with the system, by providing stimuli to the system, observing the response of the system. And on the slide here, it says building hypotheses, but it could be mental models or predictions. And it's hard for you to introspect and catch yourself building a mental model. And the Necker cube is a very famous optical illusion from psychology that was designed to help you catch your brain in the act of forming mental models. So I want you to, in a moment, ignore my voice. Just focus on the Necker cube. Relax and let your brain do what it does best, which is build up mental models or build hypotheses. All right. Let's start with the question on the slide. Which square is closer to you? The top. Aha, uh -huh, we have a categorical answer. You know, you meaning the front of your brain, your cerebral cortex, knows that neither square is closer to you, right? You know this is a two-dimensional image, but the rest of your brain will not accept that answer, right? So as you were staring at the Necker cube, what was the rest of your brain doing? It was trying to translate it into a 3D object, right? Your retina is a two-dimensional surface, and there are photons falling on it all the time. So you are also actually, even though you're embedded in a 3D world, you're receiving 2D images. One of the most important functions uh, of the mammalian brain is taking two-dimensional input and trying to interpret it as a three-dimensional scene. How, so your brain was trying to interpret this as a three-dimensional image. Hopefully it had a hard time doing so. Why? The Necker cube is designed to give that part of your brain a hard time. Uh, there are kind of two options for the front face. Um, and because there isn't really any distinction between this foreground and background line thickness, it's kind of hard to read them. Exactly, right? So given this picture, there are two mental models that your brain is trying to uh, validate, right? Either this square is closer to you and this one is further away, or this one. So which of those two mental models is correct? Neither, right? All the angles here are chosen very carefully to make sure that there is just as much evidence supporting mental model one as there is supporting mental model two. So hands up if you saw both cubes. Were there split seconds where you actually thought it was one or the other? Right? That's the back of your brain winning out over the front of your brain that knows it's neither. Most of you might have experienced them alternating. Did anybody feel that the cube was doing this? Hands up if it did. OK, that's good. How quickly was your brain going back and forth between these two mental models? Was it doing it every tenth of a second? No, no. Every 10 seconds? About every second. About every second. Most people answer about every second. It's a mystery why. Turns out that one second is, seems to be this magic frequency of the human brain. There are certain things that happen in the brain at one second intervals. 
And so when you present people with the Necker cube <coughs> without priming, so there might be some psychology students here, but assuming that you haven't been asked that particular question about the Necker cube before, most people experiencing, experience their brain going back and forth between these two mental models at about uh, one every, every second. Right? So your brain is basically saying it's mental model one. There's some evidence supporting it. Wait a second, there's a second mental model, and there's some evidence supporting that one. No, wait, it's this, it's this, it's this. Right? So the Necker cube is designed to allow you to experience your brain trying and failing to form and validate one mental model over, over another. Okay. So again, why does this matter for, for HCI? Well, be aware that your user is doing this, and they're probably not aware that they're doing this. Um, this has been put into uh, a cognitive architecture, so an explanation of uh, a pro a partic one particular process of human cognition. Uh, be aware that no one really knows what the correct cognitive architecture is. So when I say your brain is doing this and then it's doing this, put mental quotation marks around all those things. Right? It feels like your brain is doing that. Who knows what your brain is, is actually doing. Okay, so your user is doing something that feels like this or results in predictions. And now how the brain is actually doing it, we're not going to go into that. Usually that process of forming mental models is in service of a particular goal. Your user is trying to figure out where is the turn off messaging uh, alarm option. There's different things, different goals <coughs> that your user might be trying to achieve given your interactive system. And given those different goals, there's different ways they're going to push against your system and observe how your system pushes back. So this particular flow that you can find in your textbook is named after Donald Norman's seven stages uh, model of activity. You can also imagine six or eight. It doesn't, doesn't matter too much. But the basic flow is here. right? In this cartoon here, we're assuming that the user is trying to build up a mental model in the same way that your brain was just trying to build up a mental model of the system. In order to build up the mental model, you're going to have to interact with the system. So you form an intention to act or push against the object, and you come up against the gulf of execution, which means if I want to learn about the system, what should I do? And choosing what to do or how to interact with the system can be non-trivial. A lot of people will just give up and do things at random or do things systematically. It turns out that there are things you can do that are much better than that. We'll come back to that in a moment. So you want to build up a mental model. You decide in order to do so, you're going to have to interact with the system. You decide on how you're going to interact with the system. You do, and then you see how the system pushes back. You interpret the perceptions you receive, and now you come up against the second gulf, which is known as the gulf of evaluation. So you, chose, you pushed against the system, and it pushed back. Does that result tell you anything or take you anywhere any closer to your goal? So if our goal is to build a mental model or, or whatever our goal is, the gulf of evaluation is, what should I do? I just turned on this new app and the screen is blank. What should I do next? That's the gulf of, uh, uh, sorry, that's the gulf of execution. What, what action should I perform? What is it that I want to do with this app? When I did something and it gave me back a result, am I learning about the system uh, or not? Am I getting more confused or am I starting to build up a mental model? This is just a more detailed way to get at one of the challenges of HCI, which is presenting data to the user or supporting an interaction which allows them to cross these two gulfs. The moment they turn on their app, you should at least give them some information about what they should be doing. Should they be tapping the screen, swiping the screen, pressing a button? And if they do, show them something so they say, oh, I get this system. I see how this works. I get the, I get the idea, right? I know what the interaction is going, to, is going to be. OK. So I'll just finish with this slide for today. Um, let's come back to the robot for a moment. So the robot had the same problem, right? It was trying to build up a model. In this case, it was trying to build up a model of itself. So it also had to cross. Uh, it had to cross these two gulfs. So let's start to let's start with the gulf of evaluation. How do I know whether my actions, in the case of the robot, moved it closer to its goal? 
We already talked about that. We told the robot you can cross the gulf by comparing these sensor signals. So see if you can find a mental model that gets these two sets of sensor data coming back from the physical robot and the simulated robot to, to match. If, you, if the physical robot is moving and it's collecting new sensor data and it's looking through new mental models and those mental models are getting closer and closer to reality, they're matching the robot's physical experience, then it knows that it's doing the right thing. Whatever the physical robot is doing, it's getting closer and closer to its goal. We got one minute left. This is a, this is a tricky one. Gulf of execution. So the robot moved once and came up with all these mental models, a whole bunch of them, they're all different, but they all matched the robot's physical experience. What should the, how should the physical robot move the second time? This is very tricky to cross this particular gulf. The robot could do something at random, and it would get some new data. It turns out that the robot can do something much better than random, and so can humans. What you do is not to move randomly, but move in a way that causes your current mental models to disagree. This cartoon here, let's imagine that the robot moved once, and it's now come up with these two different mental models that both explain the first action. The robot says, OK, I get to move a second time. How should I move? So it takes this second action, and before the physical robot moves in reality, it feeds that action to both of these robots. This robot tilts to the left, and this robot tilts to the right. This model is predicting, a hey, physical robot, if you move in this way, I predict you're going to tilt to the left. The second mental model says, no, 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 you're wrong. If you perform this particular second action, I predict you're going to tilt to the right. They can't both be right. The, ro the physical robot is going to carry out this action, and it's going to either tilt to the left or turn to the right, or tilt in some other way. And these models are going to be, one, at least one of them is going to be wrong, which is good because it's trying to find the correct one. It helps it weed out the good models from the bad ones. So in the video that you saw, the evil starfish was not moving randomly. It moved once, produced some mental models, and then chose another way to move to distinguish between these models. I didn't notice it so much today, but a lot of people, when they watch the Necker Cube, they move their head subtly. You're actually moving in a way to try and figure out which of your two mental models is wrong? And unfortunately, there is no way you can move your head to figure out which is right, because neither of them are, are right. OK, I think we'll stop there. We'll talk about these two golfs again on Thursday. There is a quiz that's due at midnight tonight. Get a jump start on deliverable four, because there might be a lot of new material for many of you. Thank you.